at this before. You know how you know it's a good morning? They're all good mornings. God made them all. <laughs> Even the ones that are hard, they're all good mornings. God's got his hand on every one of them. If we didn't have, we would really, we would really be in dire straits if God wasn't in control. Because if God's not in control, no one is. And this world is just running in circles, and it's not. It's, it, it's, there's a reason for everything. You know, when we, when we read the verse that we just read, speaking of God, being careful not to think of that God is tempting us with evil. And that's what that means, by the way, when it says he never tempts anyone. It doesn't mean that he doesn't put us through trials so that we will grow. It means literally that it is, a, it, that it, is, it is true of God that he will only test you for good. He will never test you to do evil. And so if you are uh, under pressure by God, it will help you to grow the next time you'll be able to be stronger in that same situation. However, you have an enemy who will do just the opposite, and that is you, he will tempt you and test you to do evil or to fail. And as he does, he wants you to be destroyed. He wants to, ki to kill, to steal, and to destroy, the Bible says. And as we, and as we see that, we are... Uh, going back in our minds as to what last week, and that was the choices that we make, the choices that are before us, and we are to choose now, if you remember that, that sermon. Well, I, I thought, got to thinking about, as I, as I said that last week, I hinted at and mentioned the story of the prodigal son. And as, I, and as that hit me, as I was even preaching last week, um, it hit me that the prodigal son needs to be taught again. And so, and so we, I, it come in the form of choices. There's three choices that we see in the story of the prodigal son. We see this one where he is tempted and to do evil. He is tempted to rebel. And as he and as he is tempted to rebel, bless his heart, he tempted to re, to rebel against his father. We are uh, we are aware that we were, that we are too. But there's two others that are that are there that are that are uh, the the choice that is being made is the choice to forgive and the choice to be bitter. And that's what we're going to look at in the, over the next few weeks. So looking at this, I'm going to read the entire passage of the, of the, of the prodigal son. So fall in, if you will, with me. And in, in, in Luke chapter 15, verse 11 through 32, he says, and he said, there was a, there was a man who had two sons and the younger of them said to his father, father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself and said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hard servants. And he rose and came to his father. But while he was still a long ways off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, 
and shoes on his feet and bring him the fatted, bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now there, his older son was in the field and when he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called out one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you and I never, I never disobeyed your command. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came and he was de and who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted kiff for him. And he said to him, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. It is fitting to celebrate and to be glad for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the reading of your word. We thank you that it can go into our hearts and into our minds. And as we give the Holy Spirit the, uh, the room to work in our hearts today, I pray that it would not just fall on our ears, but that it would sink down into our hearts and that each one of us would take something home with us from this passage of Scripture, Lord, that we would see ourselves somehow in this. And that we would come to the point of realizing our need for repentance and realizing our need to be forgiven for the things that we have done whereby we have squandered the life you have given us, Lord. And we ask you to be the one who is glorified and that we would be humbled in Jesus' name. Amen. So there's a choice here, a choice to rebel. There is a choice that this young man made in the sense of, in the sense of having everything that he, that his father, had put together in his place, and it's too, it's 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 too poignant almost for me to even talk about because I've been there with a with a with a current day situation, just not that that many years ago, of a father and a and a mother who loved their children very deeply, very, very much Christian people who put together a, a ranch worth millions of dollars and had their children turn on them and try to take the ranch away from them before they were gone. And the sadness that went through that story is true because I was chosen because the church, they tithed their, after they had died, they tithed their portion to the church that I was pastoring and in doing so they asked me to come in and help arbitrate listen there is nothing any sadder than to hear the savageness of people turn on their own parents they started this lawsuit before the parents were dead by the time I got involved the parents were gone they were dead they were in heaven and how sad it is to know that even though their parents were not perfect and they were in many ways, there was a, a lot to be uh, seen there as needed to be changed. But still there was that hurt and that heartbreak of seeing those children rebel and try their best to take everything that, the, that was there away from, the, away from them and the lawyers having to fight for it. <laughs> I know... I remember that whenever the time came that they asked me, well, well, what about the money that they gave the church? What, what, what do you say to that? And it was, a, it was a phone call that was people in Denver, people, uh, uh, lawyers in Denver and lawyers in the, in the room around me. And they said, what are you going to do about that? And I said, well, I will just say one thing about that. They gave that money to the Lord. And if these kids think they want to take that money away from that was given to God, 
God have mercy on them. And the whole room went dead silent. And the phone in Denver was dead silent. And they said, well, I think that fits, that fixes that point. <laughs> and I was done with my, with my arbitration. But the thing is, is as we look at this, what heartbreak is in this story? Here, and we see a, an actual parable that is given to show us what it feels like whenever we rebel against our Father, God. And how that we as children of God have everything to, that, that he could give us and yet we want to say mine, mine, mine and struggle and fight over it. In, Luke, in, 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 in chapter 15 there in, in verse 12, it reminds us, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that I have come unto me. And he divided his property between them. You know what? I'm going to get into this a little bit later, but uh, this was so wrong on so many different levels. Number one, that was not his property. That was not that was not that young son. We'll talk about it a little bit more, but he was in the sense he was taking and and coveting and desiring what was not his. And what is one of the Ten Commandments that says that we should not covet what is not ours? There's 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 people who want someone else's wife. There's people who want money that is not theirs. There is people who will steal and, 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 and they'll, they'll kill and they'll destroy and all they're doing is doing the wishes of the one who is our enemy in the whole process of it. And so when we look at this, we realize that he was coveting the good life that his own father had earned and had made in this process. And, and, and we are reminded, and I'm going to constantly keep this in front of you, we're reminded that we too sometimes covet things that is not ours to have, and we don't realize that it's God would give it to us if it was what God wanted us to have. He desired the things that was not His, and we sometimes desire the things that are not ours. And James 1.15 says, Then desire when it is conceived gives birth to sin, and sin when it is fully grown brings forth death. You know, the riches that he was coveting and that he wanted did not belong to him. Number one, he was not the elder son. He was the younger son. In that society, the younger son didn't get anything if the father didn't specifically give it to him. And the older son got everything and the younger son got whatever the father said before he died. However, the, the younger son is demanding equally, if I can say this this way, socialistically, that it be spread among them evenly. And it's not that was not his call. He was also that the father was the one to choose what, what he the, to choose whatever that son got, not, not the one who was to be making the call. The son was not to be the one making the call. And number three, and I didn't put this one in here, the father wasn't dead yet. And it, that's what reminded me of this other family, is they wanted, to, they wanted to drive the lawyers to get them what they had, didn't deserve but they got to get them before their parents were even gone. How must God feel when we are so demanding of him of things that he has not yet given us? It doesn't mean that we're not going to get it. It means that we're not going to get it now. And sometimes we don't see that. So we have to be careful to realize that we don't dare do what, what this set of verses in James talks about. That sin, when it conceives... See, there, we're tempted of our own lusts to have what we don't deserve. And yet that desire, really the desire is not sin. There's no sin in desiring something. But it says, but when the desire has conceived, 
it brings forth sin. In other words, we, we want it on our own lusts to be able to have this thing, but it's only when we act upon it that sin steps into the, into the equation. I'm going to be real honest with you. A young man sees a pretty girl and he can't help but think like a young man thinks when he sees a pretty girl. However, that's not sin. The sin comes in when he acts upon it. And it's the same way for all of us. And when you see something that you want to have, there's nothing wrong with that as long as we kick in with the with the uh, step of, 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 of faith that says we control what we think and we don't act upon it. But when it's acted upon, when you see something you want and you steal it, there's the sin. When you want something for yourself and you feel like you deserve it and you do that which brings in, as this young man did in demanding of his father, the interesting thing in this whole story is, is the father gave it. He divided to the younger and older alike. That's what it means that he divided it between them. When the father, he went to that father and he demanded what he, want, what, what he had to be given him, that, there's where the sin was. But you see, as he went on his way and as he obviously according to the passage got involved in no doubt drinking and drugs and 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 prostitution of of of, of being in, involved with the 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 illicit lewd side of life we don't and we're not told the whole story and i'm glad because it probably is an ugly ugly story but he comes to the end of his money this was a wealthy man and he gave that which he had to both his sons. And then this one completely destroys what he had given him in sin. And it says that he came to himself. Well, there's what, what happened before he came to himself. Well, he hired himself out, if you remember the story. He hired himself out into the fields to feed the swine. Now, we don't feed swine in the fields the way they did, so I put it into the perspective of a pig pen. If you've ever been around a large swine operation, you can imagine what this young man was probably involved in. By the way, it, it, it tells you where he was because he, a, a Jewish man would not have swine, would not have pigs. That was an unclean animal. They wouldn't touch it. And so here's this young Jewish boy, if you will, in the middle of feeding the hogs that he was, that was totally unclean to him. And yet he's in there with them and he gets so hungry because he wants to be fed even what the pigs are eating, and no one will allow him to even have that. I, I would say, wouldn't you, that this, is, this young man was on rock bottom. Sadly enough, sometimes to come to our senses, God has to take us down to where the skin's coming off our nose as we go down the road. The point is that I want to make is, is that you don't have to be there first. At any moment in this story, he could have stopped and said, no, wait, let me rethink this. But he didn't. And so he's on rock bottom. And he is deeply involved in sin. But there's a choice that he can make to repent. And that's what he does. And that is in our, in our story he come to himself. Huh, I like that phrase. He came to himself. He knew better than this. He know, you know, when we are about to dive into sin, it's already in your mind that you shouldn't do that. If you've got anything at all of a moral upbringing, you don't go there. 
But if us Christians could be serious and honest with ourselves for a minute, when we get involved in sin, we have the Holy Spirit screaming in our ears, do not do this, do not do this, do not do this. And he says, when he came to himself, I think there was a, I think there was a, a true conversion that comes here. And he says, to, he says, my father's servants don't get treated this way. I'm starving to death and I can't get anything to eat. And he said, I'll go back to my father because my father doesn't even treat his servants this way. I'll go back to my father and tell him, I'm not worthy to be your son. Just let me be a servant. Just let me be a slave. And he comes back and he decides, see, there's a choice. He decides to get up out of the pig pen. He came to himself. You know, changing, your, changing direction always, always, always starts with changing your mind. I thought this was going to be good. This is not good. I changed my mind. That changing your mind is not repentance, but it's a start to repentance. Repentance truly happens when you change directions. And whenever he sees his stupidity and he gets up and he chooses to go home. It's interesting that as he makes his choice to go home, he rehearses his own speech. Do you catch it that he, in, in, the, in the narrative that he says to himself, this is what I'm going to say. What did he say when he saw his dad? Exactly what he rehearsed. He had, he had planned it out. I know what to say. You know what? When you, when you find yourself in the presence of a holy God and you have lived a life of sin, number one, you need to come to yourself. Number two, you need to change your mind. And that change of mind leads you into a change of direction. And as you do, there is a confession that has to take place. He decides to relinquish his, his previous direction. He decides to not be just stagnant about his situation. And he leaves everything that the evil had led him into, the destructive life that he had, the, 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 the unprofitable situation he was in. And he plans his repentance his decision to leave what had destroyed his life leads him to, to rehearse. I don't even deserve to be a son. I would say that's pretty humble. I would say he had been brought to the position of being humble. He made a decision and he confessed his sin. And as he confesses his sin, what is confession? It simply means to agree with God in our lives when we confess what we have done when we come to our senses and when we stand up out of the pig pen that we're in we have to make a decision to go home to go back to the father and he was willing to do whatever it took including being humiliated when he got back home so what the elder brother does to him when he gets home is not foreign to this young man's mind he's already been there he's already thought about this they're going to mock me. They're going to say I was stupid. My friends that I was with at that time are going to mock me and say I was stupid to ever go home. And those at home are going to mock me and say I was stupid to leave. But he was willing to even be humbled and humiliated at that point. So he makes a choice. See, I've already talked about it. A choice to be rebel. A choice to repent and come back. And now there's a choice to return. And so he gets up. He arose and came to his father. And while he was yet a long ways off, his father saw him and felt compassion. God loves you right where you are. God loves you in the midst of whatever you're in. But he cannot do anything unless you are willing to repent. 
unless you are willing to say, I'm, this was a stupid decision to be here. And I will leave this place. And I will go back even if it means I am nothing but sweeping the floors in the, in the, in the, in the halls of heaven. And even though that's not going to be a problem for you. We think that. His eyes were opened as to where his sin had led him. And he saw his life just exactly what had happened with him. And so he gets up from where he's at and he starts home. You know that first step home is the hardest one. But in his mind, I think it didn't matter how far it was to go back home. He had set his heart and he'd set his mind to go home. And it just seemed like just a little ways away. When we see the Father next week, we will see it was really, truly only a little ways away. And when you yourself come to your senses and give God the glory of being able to say, God, I agree with you. This was wrong in my life. I'm willing to turn away. I'm willing to repent. And you turn from your sin and you find out that God has been coming to meet you the whole time. He never left you. He's right there with you. He confesses and he repents. He's willing to give up everything that he had at home to be able to be reconciled to his father. I look at us and I say, we have to be willing when we are find ourselves in some stupid sin that we be willing even as Christians to just say, it doesn't matter what happens. The truth must come out. I have to live the truth. I have to confess to my God. You know, the Catholic Church is rife with teaching that they have to confess to the priest. I have news for you. In your case, that is not true. You are the priest once you have accepted Christ as Savior. And you don't have to confess your sins to any man. You confess your sins to God and let the one who can get you out of it, let him get you out of it because he's already paid that way. He's already given you that right to turn to him and see that he is right there. He's right there coming down the road to meet you. And you just fall on your knees and say, God, here I am. And he'll forgive you. We're going to talk about that next week. And he'll forgive you. So where are you? What sin has you in the pig pen of life? I can't answer that for you and you can't answer that for me. And it's a good thing because I don't need to know where you're at in that fashion and you don't need to know where I'm at in that fashion. However, when we love each other as the church loves each other, God is going to give you, and we studied this in Sunday school, God is going to give you gifts of the Holy Spirit that you are to apply to the church to see the church grow into a healthy organism and then to take that growth and go out into the world around us. And the people that can't hear it or don't want to hear it, they need to hear it. And the only way they're going to ever hear it is maybe something that you have in your life that can reach them. I talked about Asa being in... in needing to have Monty call him and having Monty call him every week. But you have to understand, Monty came through that same situation. He came through that, that pit of alcoholism so that God could use that somehow to talk to him, talk through him to this young man. And Asa doesn't mind me using his name. He knows. He talks to me willingly. 
but can you understand the steps that you're willing to take? Are you willing to repent to get here, to get where we're usable? Are you willing to get up and to repent and to turn around and turn away? That word repent scares people, but all it really means is to change your mind about who you are and what you are doing in life and turn away from it. And as you, the word means literally to turn around. As you turn around, you turn your back on what your sin was and you turn your face toward God and you desire to get in and help someone else. All it takes is one step to start back to the Father's arms. But are you willing? And if you are, then you make the first move. It doesn't mean that you'll get to do it all on your own. It doesn't mean you have to conjure up the power to do it. Because what you'll find out is the minute that you start to say, Heavenly Father, here I am, He's going to fill you with all the rest of it. The power of the Holy Spirit is that which takes you and comforts you and helps you along the way. And so as you start to make that move of repentance, He fills in the need. He fills in the power that it's going to take to get out of that life. You've got to quit doing it on your part. You've got to quit doing it under your power. You've got to relinquish that as a fallacy. You can't do it. That old song, I did it my way. That's the worst thing that was ever taught to anybody. You don't do it your way. Even the little bit of effort that you make has to have the power of the Holy Spirit of God behind it for you to be able to do it. Because our hearts are desperately wicked The Bible says, who can know it? Who can know how much wickedness is in this heart? So God wants you to make that first move knowing that he's going to be the one that gives you the power to take the second step. It's not your power, it's his. Let's just play pretend for just a minute. I, I didn't plan on this, but let's just play pretend for just a minute. You decide you're going to get up and you're going to turn away from whatever sin there is in your life that is besetting you. And you say, God, here I am. I'm no good. And that's basically what this young man said. I'm no good on my own. I proved that. But I'm willing And he turns from his sin and you turn from your sin. God's going to give you the power to do what it takes to take that step. I don't care if you said you were a Christian when you were born. You must have a time in your life when you can remember saying, I want to throw everything else away in my life but Jesus, and I want Jesus. I want Him to forgive me of my sins, and I want Him to cleanse my heart. And at that moment, you turn away, in my, in my little scenario, you turn away finding that God is right there to take you in His arms and to give you the strength to take another step, and to take another step. You go down the road a little ways and somebody's going to meet you on the road and say, now come on, let's, let's go party. Let's go do this. Let's go do that. Let's, you used to enjoy doing this. It's going to take God's power to say no. You cannot do it on your own. I guess I'm preaching to all of us, including me. But we need to say, I cannot do it. I have to have God's help. One of the key points of Christianity, the doctrines, is that the total depravity of man 
And it doesn't mean that men, man is totally depraved at all times. <laughs> In all ways, it means we are totally incapable of doing anything good or right, except that God does it. Once you are saved, you can do it good because God is right here. He's no longer a God out there somewhere. He's right here. He lives in you. He resides in you. And he will strengthen you from within. So when you do, then it's God doing it. And you're just following along. Take that step and watch God give you the strength. Heavenly Father, as we close in prayer, I pray that Father, as, as, as we all stand up and as we... And as, we, and as we take this time to just put ourselves on the, on the line and say, here I am, God. You heard this. You heard my heart cry and when I realized that I needed to come closer to you. I need to come out of the pig pen and come your direction. Here I am, Lord. Take me. And Father, no matter how many years we've been saved, I know that we constantly are going to need that so we ask during this last song that you would just break hearts, burden hearts, cause some others to come to the need of just getting up and saying, God, I'm not worthy, but I'm going to take a step. And watching you provide the power. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand and let's sing together this old song means so much to so many because many, many years this is the song you heard at invitations every, everywhere you went. It is an invitation. It's an invitation to come. To come to God. To get up out of that pig pen and come home. Just as you are. That's how God wants you. He doesn't want you to change first. He wants you just as you are and then come to Him. Here we go. Just as I am without one plea, but that my heart was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. as I am and wait one day you might get it on there, there it is let's try again Becky. Just, just let's start at the first of that verse again just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blood to thee whose blood clean cleans each spot, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Just as I am, and thou tossed about with many a conflict, many a doubt, fightings within, and fears without, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. You see God's there waiting for you the whole time. He's not been absent. He's been right there waiting for you to say, Here I am, I come, Lord, I come. All I'm asking is that we take it serious and we no longer hold back, but that we find ourselves quicker and quicker to jump up and say, No, God, that's, that's not what I want. I want to be free of that. You've got to pray to be free of it. 
and expect God to work. Maybe it's not drinking and drugs and prostitutes and that kind of thing in our lives. Maybe it's just the way we talk to other people. Maybe it's just the, the thoughts that we have in our minds that we act upon and we say things to each other that are not, not healthy. Who knows what it is? Mainly, God wants you to repent of all of those things. Husbands treating their wives, wives treating their husbands, neighbors treating neighbors. We need God's provision and God's protection. Thank you, Heavenly Father for being there for us that no matter what we're going through that we would be led of you right now. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Thank you.